Okay, I guess we can start. First of all, thank you very much for joining this discussion forum. Uh, I believe we we are all a bit busy and especially the people that are now working on the hackathon. So thank you so much for being here still. Uh, well, I would like to yeah, welcome the people here in person, but also those that are joining us uh, via uh, the webinar on Zoom. Uh, well, pretty much uh, we will talk about what can our Python and Julia uh, development communities do to combat the climate crisis. This is the topic that brings us all here today. And I will briefly explain the, dyna the dynamic that we will use during this discussion forum. So uh, we have here a panel of four experts. Um, they will have presentations of 10 minutes each where they will expose and they will give their opinions and angles about this question that um, we have decided for the discussion forum. So we will hear from them. Uh, according to their expertise and the places that they work on, um, how do we answer to this question? So it's also an invitation for you to reflect upon this uh, question and bring, uh, hopefully, new solutions and new answers to this question. My name is Beatriz Arabia. I'm a communication officer for Open Geo Hub Foundation. We're based in the Netherlands, and as you know, uh yeah we are the the ones hosting next to the uh, university this uh magnifico um uh, open geo hub summer school 2023 we'll start with this so this event is also sponsored by the open earth monitor a project uh this project um is uh part of a uh, horizon projects uh, funded by the European Commission. This uh, project is a consortium of 21 European organizations, but led by OpenGeoHub. The o a OEMC project aims at building an AI ML based computing engine, anchoring fair data principles and capable of processing large volumes of geospatial data to support tools that monitor environmental change. The outcomes are open source solutions called monitors, which be, will be developed by our partners to be used in real life applications or use cases uh, that will ultimately serve multiple stakeholders, such as local governments, policymakers, scientists, uh, research organizations, and some others.
uh, as part of the OMC project, uh, we have a global workshop that will take place in Bolzano in October. So I take the opportunity to invite you all to go to the website and explore our program and maybe get yourself a bit excited and hopefully we will see you or some of you at least in, in Bolzano. Uh, there we will have some keynotes from several organizations like WRI, the World Resources Institute, the ESA, the European Spatial Agency, uh, JRC, the Joint Research Center for the European Commission. And of course, it's an opportunity for you to network and to get as much knowledge as you can from experts uh, that are, yeah, that will be part of this event. Well, I will now go into the interactive part of this discussion forum, and it's a Slido. Uh, here you will see this QR code for you to scan. And um, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with Slido or maybe have used Kahoot. It's also a similar platform for you to join and actively participate while we have the discussion here. Um, I will just give you a moment for you to do this. You have uh, two options. You can either scan the QR code and join directly, or you can also download the app, enter this number, or using your browser, you can do that. Uh, just do whatever will be more convenient for you. Maybe if you're running programs or you have other stuff going on in your computer. One so. second. Like make it as small as possible. You need to connect, otherwise you cannot participate, which will be a pity. And it's anonymous, like the says one more time. Yeah. Yes. So in Slido, you will find a QI. Q and A section where you can write your questions to our to our speakers. Uh, if a question goes to one specific speak, expert, I will uh, ask you to please write down in the question the name of the speaker that you're addressing your question to. Uh, if not, you can write it anonymously, and maybe one of our speakers can take the lead and answer the question. Uh, there's a second type of question, and it's like. Um, polls or word clouds. And you will also have a moment to vote for these questions and give your opinion. In the uh, specific case of word clouds, you can only enter three words. So keep that in mind. And if somebody, of course, wants to elaborate on uh, any of their answers, uh, you just feel free to go ahead. You can raise your hand. We will hand over the mic to you and that will, yeah. That way we can maybe go a bit deeper onto the question. Um, I will then, if someone in, uh, wants to participate in the room, I will repeat the question for the people online to follow. And yeah, that will be the way to go. So right now you can start uh, typing your questions on the Q&A section. Um, I will go through the questions at the end of all the presentations. So, but still, you can now start uh, typing your questions, okay? For the people on Zoom, uh, it's the same case. In the Zoom um, bar, you will see an option with the Q&A where you can type your question and also you can raise your hand and we will unmute you and give you the opportunity to participate here. So I will read the objectives of this discussion. First is discuss the advantages and disadvantages and dif of different programming languages for data analysis and processing. Uh, review existing top level solutions to organize large EO data, share and enable researchers and organizations to make use of it for applied purposes. How do we all make environmental data more usable, accessible, and more relevant? 
And how do we get the code we developed to be used to combat climate crisis more effectively? Okay. Now, uh, I will briefly uh, state who are the panelists that I will be uh, presenting their point of view today. First will be Edser Bebesma. He's director of the Institute for Geoinformatics and professor of the University of Munster. Then we will have Lorena Abad, researcher at ZGIS, and, the, and she is part of the Department of Geoinformatics in the University of Salzburg. Then we will have Anita Grasser, spatial data scientist of the Austrian Institute of Technology in Vienna. And at the end, we will have Marte Pronk, uh, geodata scientist at the Deltaris in the Netherlands. Well, uh, I will not take more time and we will start with Edser. Um, Edser, um, leads the Spatial Temporal Modeling Laboratory at the Institute of Geoinformatics and is currently head of the Institute. He holds a PhD in Geosciences and is interested in spatial statistics, environmental modeling, geoinformatics, and GI science, semantic technology for spatial analysis, optimizing environmental monitoring, and also in e-science and reproducible research. So I give you the floor, Ed, sir. <laughs> So uh, just press down, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So first of all, uh, so thanks so much for uh, to to Open GeoHub um, for organizing not only this uh, this summer school but also this uh, session and uh, that that revolves around a very uh, relevant and an important question that I think uh, many of, of us, many of you have have also sort of asked yourself, like you know, we see all these things happening and. And uh, and then sort of the question: Do I do the right thing? Or, or to what extent is sort of thing I do the sort of you know pushing things in the right direction or possibly in the wrong direction? Right? And uh, this is this is kind of these these morality questions that are uh, you know somewhat uh, somewhat pressing you know at the more uh, difficult moments in life. Um, so we we. Um, Roger and I have worked for a long time on writing books and and recently last seven years on them. On a book that just just appeared, where where there are two small sections from the preface uh, that I wanted to uh, to read with you. It feels like reading from a Bible a little bit, but uh, that's the first the first little paragraph says something about what data science is, what we believe the data science is. Though data science is concerned with finding answers to questions on the basis of available data and commun communicating that effort. Besides showing the results, this communication involves sharing the data used but also exposing the path that led to the answers in a comprehensive and reproducible way. So this is what, what we believe that data science in a positive, you know, another negative explanation would be making money from data, from all the data that you collect and so on. Uh, but what we believe from a sort of the scientific uh, positive attitude, uh, what it would be in, in to the, the aspects of what we, we try and would like to contribute. Uh, and we end that, uh, that pre most of that preface with a, a paragraph that basically says what where things come from. And we say platforms that have helped create an open research community include the AI Geostats a long time ago, R6 Geo mailing lists, SourceForge, RForge, GitHub, and the Open Geo Hub summer schools that have in previous decades a different name, uh, but organized since 2007. I learned yesterday, the day before yesterday, to write a typo in the book. The current possibility. A willingness to cross data science language barriers opens a new and very exciting perspective. Our motivation to contribute to this field, to the field of spatial data science, is a belief that open science leads to better science and that better science might contribute to a more sustainable world. So there we basically express that, that there is some, some kind of hope that we at least have or, 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 or a belief, which is a little bit more, but not, it's not like that it is a given or that this is a fact. Uh, and uh, indeed, if you if you are in the you know if you are in the area of, of, of software development and development development of tools that you you distribute and give and, and basically share with anyone, then then you share it with let's say with the good guys as well as with the bad guys, right? So you don't know what's what's going to happen. You need we, nobody tracks. We don't want to track that and so on. And so do you, so you don't know. So it is a, a hopeful activity and. Uh, there is no guarantees that uh, one thing happens more than the other. Um, 
The uh, another thing is that the thing that I talked this morning about is of course uh, um, cloud computing, right? And cloud computing is something that that you hope is being done for you know for a good cause for for doing things that that learn is something about the world and that maybe help in, in doing good things. The bad thing is, of course, that it costs all kind of uh, electricity and all kind of energy and, and resources and computers and, and so on, and, and that you don't see this, so you have really no clue of, of what's going on. So interestingly, there's a whole sort of uh, activity going on now on, the, on the, the German research software engineering list about how you could measure this sort of the use of, of the energy consumption of things and, and the, the efficiency of languages and things that you do and so on. Um, I have been working this uh, spring on a paper, on a poster that was presented at EGU with a PhD student of mine, uh, where we looked at um, the resolution at which you do computations. Yeah, there is a lot of high resolution now data and continental mappings based on Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 data where we map continents on a 10 meter resolution. And I always wonder who's waiting for all these pixels, right? So what is often happening is that that they are at some stage, they are counted, right? And, and you look at counts of fractions of land use and so on. And if you count things over areas, you don't have to do every 10 meter pixel. So we looked at sort of doing counts for larger areas. And what happens if I don't do this every 10 meter, but I do it every 50 meter, every 100 meter, every 500 meter, every kilometer. And you can see then sort of how the errors increase and how your accuracy decreases. but Still, when you do things at a kilometer for the cases we looked at, it was perfectly fine. So that is a factor million less computation that you can do. Right? So there is some saving there. If you basically think about statistics about what's going to happen, and then you could do the 10 meter pixels at the moment that somebody really asks for them, for instance, right? It's just a Google Earth Engine uh, paradigm. So, so these are considerations that that start to become more um, more um, common. And this was actually also presented in, in a very nice session at the EGU that was about sustainability of earth science, earth, uh, earth sciences uh, itself, the way, we, the way we do science and things we do and, and how we do things. So that was very interesting that that is happening. Um, another worry that I have is the, uh, is the communication aspect that I, that I mentioned a couple of times in the brief slide. Um, there is this problem about publication right now that worries me a lot. Uh, the, the idea that after finishing the content, the work that uh, finishing content, meaning finishing your text and your figures and your, and your results, you have to prepare a manuscript in a way for journals that's really a waste of time. And the way we basically explain how you can easily share reproducible work by doing notebooks, uh, quarto documents on markdown and so on, have no place in the current publication practice yeah if you where where can i send my paper as a notebook right and that is that is something that is really uh, bad and this is the problem of basically scientists and, and and publishers being on completely different lines and but but scientists accepting the publishers do this right and we sort of stay with them and, and playing with them and luckily the Re european commission uh, more and more takes sort of an Offensive attitude against it and said this has to this has to change. Right? Um, other possibilities are Git Git Actions type platforms where you basically uh, could share reproducible assets, right? Uh, but these things are relatively hard to create and manage. These are just thoughts. Uh, other things I was looking, I was thinking about is and, and talking about is uh, APIs, vendor lock-in, uh, OpenEO as an as a, as a movement and so on. Um, there is a problem with with uh, software that you that you work with that's behind APIs and it's not uh, open source. Is that the ten minute bell or yeah. okay? <laughs> the, the problem is that if if things behind an API are, are are closed source, then it's not something that you can share or that you can investigate what it what's going about, and that you get basically uh, that you get a kind of locker in effect. Um, if the compute if computations should be uh, the foundations for further computations, then they should be examinable and sustainable. That means that sustainable in the sense of open source software implementations. Sustainable computing can only be implemented in fully open source frameworks. And as I mentioned a couple of times today uh, with OpenEO, we, we, we are working on an effort that aims exactly at that, with sustainable computing in the sense of sustainable, in the sense of 
repeatable and, and understandable. Sustainable computing can hopefully form the basis for open science, open science for agreement on facts and subsequent political decision making. This is, of course, hopeful statements. We see a lot of cases where this is not sort of working out, where people, you know, sort of cling on beliefs that, uh, you know, that climate change is not man-made and so on. Fossil fuel is good. Uh, but uh, what else can we do? Is my question. So that is what I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Ed, sir. Now I will um, give the floor to Lorena Abad. Lorena is particularly interested and experienced in geographic information systems and remote sensing topics, as well as spatial data, statistical analysis, and statistics applied to several research areas. She is a PhD researcher working with geospatial technologies. So, Lorena, oh, uh, thank you for that intro and. Um... Um, I'd like to start saying that this is the point of view of a very early, early career scientist here, and it's uh, really nice to be uh, right behind Ed Sarah because he had quite some interesting views of all his experience. And what I wanted to do here is a little bit show you how my path was when I started working with um, problems uh, related to the climate crisis. And um, yeah, and all the projects that I more or less went through and um, sort of developed to tackle this. So um, just as an overview, I work at the Risk, Hazard and Climate uh, Research Group at the University of Salzburg, which is uh, Department of uh, Geoinformatics. And um, what I've been trying to do for some time is to push in my group that we try to work with not only open data, because that's great, we know that, we can make free use of data, and yeah, that's just a benefit, but also to push open science and uh, try to share our knowledge. And um, in that sense, I've um, managed to be able to publish a lot of the code that I've uh, worked with, even though I've had some resistance at the beginning. So um, just to give you an idea, uh, we work mainly with Copernicus data and um, yeah, because as I say, it's full, free and open access. And uh, some of the things that we start doing when I first joined the, the group, I was given the task to um, map uh, landslide dam lakes in New Zealand. And I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to start working with big tons of data uh, I chose Sentinel-2 and I chose um, Earth Engine to do that. So initially I was um, quite happy with that, of course, uh, because I thought, okay, I can just work on the cloud. Uh, I don't need to uh, download a bunch of data. I can just process everything and I get these amazing uh, results. And this is a bit of the workflow that I uh, work with. And uh, in the end, I could also share my script with people so that people could reproduce my work. And I felt quite happy. I was even uh, um, doing a lightning talk on the Geo for Good conference that the Earth Engine uh, group has. Um, and that felt quite nice. But then at some point I like tried to redo my script again and thought, oh, sometimes things are not working anymore. I need to update it over and over again because sometimes things break, right? Uh, it's closed source on one end. I don't know what's exactly happening. So um, yeah, that was not great. But um, other than that, I did find that the community, let's say of Earth Engine uh, was quite helpful. So the reason why I could develop this is because there's a big community behind sharing also their code, their projects um, and their knowledge with everyone. Uh, one of the main uh, persons that I think I inspired this in was uh, working out the Tares uh, Gena Donji. So uh, that was quite cool to know that the community was there to also give you support. But in a way, I um, decided to fall back to R. So this was the next project that I was doing. It was called Monteo, and we wanted to uh, analyze alpine infrastructure susceptibility. Um, again, with Copernicus data, so we took uh, quite some Sentinel-2 data, but other uh, variables and we were doing just some landslide susceptibility models. In this one, it was a little bit harder to um, push my beliefs and I had the whole code in R, um, but was still not completely um, 
successful in uh, publishing it, but I would love to because indeed as well, I took a lot of advantage of the community and uh, I would always like to give back. Um, so in the next project that I um, work in, that was my main commitment. I just wanted to do something that was open for everyone, that everybody could use, that used open data and that anyone can benefit and that anyone can contribute to. So this was a project called Slidem. Um, and this is to generate uh, digital elevation models out of Sentinel-1 data. Um, and what I did was, uh, my, my job was to automate the whole workflow. So this is a bit of how the workflow worked, um, but my um, mission was to make it completely shareable. So I told my team from the start, okay, I want to put everything on GitHub. I want people to be able to use it. And I want to make it so easy that no one has to think of dependencies or anything. So I put everything on the Docker container so that people could work with this. And that's been a great experience. Uh, not only because I learned a lot, I learned a lot about putting everything open, but also because it starts building a community. So you start seeing people actually using your code and uh, opening issues, having questions, maybe not completely open sometimes, not only at GitHub, but they write me emails. And then I'm like, posting the questions on GitHub so that everybody can uh, benefit. Um, but yeah, it's it's right there. So it's this building the community and just sharing these um, sources of these projects that we're doing to really make this into something. But all these projects are a little bit small scale. Um, I've also had the chance to work in a little bit bigger um, projects. So like all these other projects that I mentioned were mainly um, developed by me. But um, there's also the CentoCube.at uh, uh, project at my department, which my colleague right sitting right here is also part of uh, uh, of the development. And it's a data cube enriched with semantic data. In this case, it's uh, probably not completely open, but it was another way of seeing how to work in a community within our own department and really do this um, together. So. In the end, what I'm looking ahead and what I would like to have when working in my department is to know that I can work in an open uh, science community where I can just put my work out there that I know people will benefit and that I know that people will contribute to. And of course, also we can just find some solutions into tackling these very complex problems. Um, yeah, that's a bit uh, from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorena. Thank you for sharing your academic journey, <laughs> defending the values of open source science. <laughs> uh, now I will introduce Anita Grasser. She's a spatial data scientist, uh, open source GIS advocate and author. Her blog was born in 2010 and as a place to record thoughts and experiences using open source GIS. Her background is in information technology, specializing in geographic information science. So Anita, I give you the floor. Thanks so much for this kind introduction. Um, yeah, I interpreted um, this invitation as an opportunity to maybe look a bit beyond uh, what Earth Observation is doing. I work at the AIT, particularly in the data science and AI group, and we are like a general purpose data science and AI in all kinds of application domains, uh, from machine learning for industrial applications to data solutions for cultural heritage. So what I um, want to share with you today are just a couple of examples of the research field uh, that we term green AI or green data science. And in particular, it's two projects that I'm currently involved with uh, in the domain of mobility and transport. Uh, that's the EU project MobiSpaces, where we are looking at how to build uh, green data spaces, uh, data spaces for green mobility, as well as the project Emeralds, where we look into mobility analytics and how to provide it as a service so that can de decision makers can use mobility data to make uh, better decisions, hopefully um, make the transport systems more sustainable in their cities. 
And the third example that I want to share with you is not one I'm directly involved with, but it has a real cool data source that I also wanted to share with you to maybe get some ideas flowing. Uh, that's the AI for Trees project, a national project from my uh, colleague, uh, Yasmin Lampert. So in, in mobile spaces, the real goal is to enable data sharing and reuse and interoperability, particularly in the mobility domain. So everyone thing we saw today, uh, for example, in the morning that what Edsa presented, uh, the, this cool uh, web services where you can use EO data from a back end, you just push your workflow there and it executes. Um, you have this interoperability between different backends. They all follow a joint standard. Of course, your data sets have some variability, but you know it's Sentinel-2 or it's this or it's that. In the mobility domain, everyone is collecting data somehow. It's always different. There are so many different tracking systems. There are so many silos, so little integration, so little uh, standardized protocols that we are usually dealing with customized solutions which don't scale really. Um, so this is one of the challenges that this project wants to address, how to get to uh, advanced towards more standardized protoc protocols by involving all kinds of stakeholders and hopefully also minimizing the environmental footprint because it's not just running those things, it's also developing all those tools that has an environmental footprint, right? If we always have to customize for every single client, like we could be doing better things than writing another file parser just because the, those people made up yet another format that no one needs. Um, so maybe also one thing to think about. On the methodological side, uh, we are trying to push computations uh, to the edge so that it's not necessary to transfer all the data to the cloud and then do the computations there uh, for multiple reasons. First of all, in mobility, data privacy. If you can compute um, things locally without the raw data leaving the edge device, that might help with data privacy. Also, it reduces data transfer. So there you can reduce the requirements for communication networks, which might be able to save energy and costs, and of course, reduce the need for cloud storage and cloud processing, which we also know needs a lot of energy and water and stuff. So uh, federated learning is the idea that you can learn local machine learning models and you can uh, merge them back into global models and go back and forth um, to build a joint model together that everyone can use without having to share the raw data, basically. So that's one methodological idea of how to advance in the future. Um, the AIs for Trees uh, project um, is on the completely different spectrum. It's very, very local. The picture you can see here is one of the main data sources they are looking at. It's a terrestrial LiDAR. So all these uh, empty circles that you see here is where the LiDAR uh, scanner was situated. And then you can see the point cloud around it, how it was collecting the shape of the trees, how to measure um, um, the forest basically in, in order to understand how climate change will affect the trees in a forest uh, on, and how different species might be reacting differently and how this can be uh, helpful for, for planning uh, better forests basically and how to adapt them to climate change. Um, they also use other sensors. For example, the, I learned that these are called dendrometers. It's a fancy name for basically a metal uh, measurement uh, strip that is put around the trunk of the tree. And when the tree soaks up water and it expands, it will expand the, the, the measurement thing and the sensor will record it. And so they, they collect this data uh, and try to model how the, the trees grow uh, over within one day, how they shrink and expand, but also of course, over the seasons uh, increasing uh, the width, the circumference of the tree trunk. But uh, let me wrap back to what we heard also already, open source and open science, and particularly my pet projects in the mobility domain. Um, 
in both Mobi Spaces and Emeralds, I have the honor of working together with colleagues who are also very invested in that and who develop uh, the Mobility DB and the MIOS library, um, which are on in this mobility movement data science domain together with my library, Moving Pandas. Uh, and I think here we can discuss this point of every software, of course, has a certain um, target group, a certain use case, which it is intended for. So we have software, of course, that is for data management, like uh, MobilityDB, which is based on PostGIS, but has some extra features for dealing with, with movement data. Um, then for if you do need to do something on the, the hardware, um, closer to on edge devices, for example, more uh, energy efficient calculations, that's where, you, for example, C++ uh, library MIOS could be of help for you. Um, versus on the other side, if it's about rapid prototyping, just verifying ideas, developing uh, proof of concept, that's when I would recommend uh, going with, with moving pandas on the Python side um, so that you can minimize the effort of the data scientist to get first insights. And along this whole, um, yeah, we, we have to pick the tool that is right for the job, obviously. It's not just which tool can calculate um, a certain result with the least amount of computational effort. So um, to wrap it up, standardization is important, scientific software development is important, open science is important. Um, and I think um, with that, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita, for showcasing these interesting projects. I will, I'm sure it will be useful for all our participants. Uh, but now I would like to introduce Martin Bronk. Martin works uh, on open source software projects. These projects include clouds generating DTMs uh, derived from large scale point clouds in the Julia language using the latest research in order to calculate worldwide flood risks. He's also an external PhD candidate at the TU Delft in the 3D GeoInfo Research Group, where he obtained his Master of Science in Geomatics. Uh, Martin, please, uh, I give you the floor. Thanks for the kind words and for the invite to be on this panel. So going back to the original question of this panel was like, what can we do as development communities to combat the climate crisis? I'm not sure if we answered that already, and I always, always have my doubts about this. So share your sentiments about what can we do in this world and will it be enough? So in terms of development communities, I will probably be representing Julia in this case, probably the only Julia guy here. But I don't think it's just the development communities, right? Although maybe we have to decide we shouldn't do hackathons that only, well, only unnecessary compute power spend, right? Maybe. Um, but in, in the end, it's what happens with the world. So being here together, open source, believing in sharing your code and data and make it reproducible. I fully share these beliefs. Also, what Edser said, it, it can be used maybe by bad guys, but we believe it can be for good. But I wonder, even with all you here, and it gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling inside, does something happen outside, right? Do we change something? So these are my doubts, and it's not just today, but it's also when I chose my first job, working in the Deltaris, and even while working there, I have now these past, I fear already almost 10 years, I still have these doubts. So hopefully you can also contribute to this discussion and tell me your feelings about this. So like was introduced, I work at Deltaris, and Deltaris has many fancy mottos that I fully share, like enabling Delta life. So it really tries to make sure that we can actually live uh, in the Delta. I come from the Netherlands, mostly below sea level. So checking out how we could live in such deltas and keep it safe in the future is a really good thing. So it's an independent knowledge institute. So we do a lot of research and we try to make the world a, a better place, a livable place. Personally, I work in the Julia language, but I also do Python and many other things. Um, I make open source geospatial packages. And tonight, tonight, Yes, yeah, so I want to discuss the tooling that we create and probably the research that you can do with such tooling 
And then I think the most important part that we haven't discussed often enough yet, whether we have impact or not, um, whether we can reflect on that, um, maybe change our behavior or change the research and maybe even change the tooling to reflect that. So in Julia, it's logical to basically make high performance numerical models. And that's also what we do at Deltaro, specifically uh, in my field uh, in hydrology. Uh, for example, we made W flow, and I have a picture here of several basins, and we can measure river flow. Uh, basically, if it rains somewhere up in the mountains, the river level will be higher somewhere downstream. I want to make sure that in a floodplain, you don't flood. So we could see that it's possible impact, but this is only the tooling, right? And we make it open source, available uh, for everyone to use. We give trainings for such packages. I'm now working on a river basin modeling. So it's a water allocation model. Um, and this is common in Julia language, like I said. So the Climate Modeling Alliance, so talking about climate here again, um, they chose to um, develop uh, an oceanic model uh, in Julia. Um, apparently it was named by some developer because I don't think you can come up with the name Oceanigans. Um, great example. So then you have numerical models, right? And that hopefully enables you to give better answer to certain questions. So you can do better research. So next step would be research. So my own research, uh, I can only talk for myself here and my feelings about that is about making better elevation models. Basically, we don't have a global terrain model and I'm aiming to change that based on LiDAR data that NASA provides freely for us. ISAT2 and JEDI are open data sets. Uh, now working with Copernicus Dam, uh, also an open data set, basically bought with our taxpayers' money, uh, bought by um, from Airbus by ESA. Uh, and on top of that, when I combine those data sets, my data will be open too. And, and the code I wrote for that will be open too. And hopefully it's fully reproducible and nothing breaks in the future. We'll see. Um, and I think important, of course, is that the paper is also open access because I can describe what I do but if it's done behind the paywall, then half of the world or most of the world cannot actually access it. Um, and I have a nice picture about um, basically everything below 10 meters above mean sea level here in Southeast Asia, which is the area of the world that probably be hardest hit by sea level rise. So with this research, you can make impact assessments and you hope that that will maybe wake up some people. Maybe we can start planning for building better dikes or maybe we have to adapts. It's a bit the question of how do you combat the climate crisis, right? Do you, I don't know, attack it? How do you attack it? Do you defend? Do you give up? Uh, I don't know. So looking back at what I've done in the projects in Delta Iris, it's sometimes hard to measure any impact. I have to hope that this will be used for good and that there actually will be policy in the future that can use this research and maybe save some people or give us a safer living environment. I'll give you one example for which I know there has been impact, real change in the world. Um, and that's a project in Indonesia that I did already back, I think in 2019. It was a big project. I was only there as a young developer, young scientist, uh, using Julia to make uh, digital elevation models and measure water levels from those lighter point clouds. Um, and it was for uh, an acacia plantation in original peat forest uh, in Sumatra. So it's a nice picture here. Uh, this is a large kennel. And on the left hand side, it's basically plantation. So the hectares and hectares of plantation. Uh, original forest has been cut down. And on the right hand side, you have a original peat forest. So original jungle. And because it's on peat, and of course in the Netherlands we have peat and some places in Europe too, uh, we burned most of it with a burning peat that you will release a lot of CO2 emissions. Um, and these kennels have been dug by the plantation owners because you need to access the plantations in the middle of the jungle. And a pit, basically it's a peat swamp. So you um, make kennels and then you drain the water level and then you can actually grow some plantation. But then you get fires because everything dries out. So with the impact assessment we did based on the LiDAR data, Eventually, we gave the advice, look, if you want to save the original forest on the right-hand side, because it was dying off 
because of the low water levels and prevent forest fires, which were a really hot topic back then. Because if this burns, I think there was smog in Malaysia and all over uh, Southeast Asia. You have to basically dam those canals, build dams everywhere. So eventually, I think there were 3,000 dams built like this over, well, thousands of kilometers. Um, so the world changed. I hope it's still there. I haven't checked. I cannot check, actually. But then I think, okay, this is probably worth uh, flying there, doing these assessments, doing the research. And then we change a little bit of the world. Um, but I'm not sure if that goes for the rest of my research. I hope it does. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marte, uh, for bringing the point of view from Julia language and, of course, bringing up the importance of uh, impact assessment. So now we will start with the discussion part, the interactive part of this session. I will briefly uh, repeat how the, dyna the dynamic will work. So first of all, if by now you haven't joined uh, our Slido session, please do it now. I will give you three extra, 30 extra seconds, sorry, uh, for you to scan it or go to your browser or either download the app and then you can participate. Basically, we will go back and forth between type of questions from the Q&A, but also from the polls and from the uh, word clouds uh, questions that we have. Uh, I would like to remind you that at the end of this discussion forum, we will have a summary of the results of this Slido session. Probably we will publish a blog post about it. It will be in a few weeks. So uh, you will, yeah, hopefully you will stay posted and uh, follow how this uh, discussion forum went. And again, for the people who are watching us online, you can add your questions to our Slido Q&A, or you can also do it via Zoom. And please raise your hand either here in the room or uh, virtually, and then we can unmute you and le let you participate here. So now I will go to the Slido. We will start. I see some questions already. Let's go to polls first, then the question. Yeah, that's right. You can vote on the questions. That's right. I will probably like to start with this first question, just to know a bit better our audience. I know there's people from everywhere and probably the people that are, are joining us are also from various countries. So that's our first question. <laughs> the Netherlands, Poland, Colombia. <laughs> Poland, of course, Italy. Amazing. Okay, it looks like we have a big audience as well. You can see here at the top of 50, around 50 participants, 49. Uh, thank you so much for joining the session. I will now like to go ahead with the next question from the poll. Uh, yes. So. I will go to this question. Can programming communities cross over and join forces to help combat the climate crisis? You have the QR, you can start commenting on it. Yes, not sure or no. <laughs> what would this mean, crossover, in which sense? Um. How, yeah, like how can they collaborate, I would say, or how can they 
yeah, join forces, I guess is the best sort of word there. Okay, the answer is uh, completely positive, mostly. Some say no. <laughs> I would really like to <laughs> hear about the no. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if someone here in the room would maybe like to yeah, elaborate on this um, of, their, of uh, one of the answers or has something to add and maybe explain how would that be. Actually, we have a how. Mm -hmm. I would perhaps go with that question. No, so, how can programming communities cross over and join forces to help combat the climate crisis? You can hear, uh, use only three words. It's not like a full sentence. So, yes, you can go ahead. Specialized conference. Share knowledge, open APIs, open standards. Looks like open standards is definitely workshops. workshops. <laughs> nice one. Join projects, events like this. Yes. <laughs> Very interesting. I think. <clears throat> The philosophy of open source science has definitely make an echo on our audience here. Okay, perhaps I would like to jump to one of the Q&A questions. Let's see. So the first question, how geoscience could attract the brightest people. This question is anonymous, so it's open to any of the speakers to answer it. I don't know if one of you wants to go ahead and give their give their input on this question. What do you think? Hi, Alex. <laughs> That's a sounds... very honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think you don't necessarily need those uh, brightest individuals. You need people who can collaborate well and who are willing to, to work in a team. So sometimes very bright people are also team players, but uh, a lot of them also are not. So I think what is even more important is to, to, to come together and to be humble enough to work in a team, to, to take feedback from others. Um, so I think we need to be, we need to learn how to build these teams that, that bring everyone together and that allow for these perspectives to be shared, to, to come up with standards that are really helpful for everyone and not just for our limited Western perspective. I, I have an idea. Yes, please, Sam. I think if you, if you manage to help with the climate crisis, you become a hero. So we could uh, we could say if you if you take these tasks, you, know, you can uh, you can become a hero. So we call it to become the hero stage. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> um, so this question, I think most of you have heard it, and we're I'm definitely interested to hear the opinions. How do we stand against conspiracy theories denying climate crisis? Does any of you? Want to jump in for that one? 
I, I cannot say much there, yeah, but it, what, what I believe is that it's uh, what sort of thing is not supposed to exclude anyone to discussions. Yeah? So do not sort of give up reaching out, so to speak, and listening to other peoples and trying to understand their fears and their beliefs. Because that is pretty much the level at which things are then kind of happening, right? Maybe following on that, I would say also um, working in good scientific communication. Um, so, I mean, sometimes that's really on the scientists and the researchers, something that we're always told, like you need to outreach, you need to put your science there. Um, and that's a lot of work. But I think if we would also have like some trained people who can really do this, it will really help us all as well. I don't know if you've ever struggled with that, but um people who know how to how to communicate this uh, in a way and um really trying to as as Edsir say listen to everyone and not put yourself above anyone but just be there uh, to have a conversation that's for me yeah i think we we also need help from from journalists and yeah. from other people in the public we we need to raise awareness about false balancing going on um, in many media outlets still, and uh, we need to fight for better scientific literacy uh, in the broader population, because otherwise we will be in big trouble. If people are just looking for easy answers, they will get those easy answers, no matter if they are true or not. Okay, thank you for your input. There's a there was a hint in there. I I was just like coming from those two things like conspiracy mm -hmm. theory and cases, right? I think that we read people in the dark mm -hmm. gives the opportunity. I would say the uh, part is that the increase there to uh, promote uh, using the uh, bad energy and the dirty energy, they are really interested in uh, feeding the conspiracy theories against the climate change. So educating people really gives people the opportunity to see what's actually going on and why those conspiracy theories are Thank you so much. Anyone else would like to add something? Here, I think one one problem with politics is it's a way of trying to be open minded and always accept other hypotheses. Sometimes you give too much credit to um, ideas that are just bullshit, and sometimes it's important to say, "No, that's wrong. I've got loads of evidence behind me, and these are the reasons why." And I see it sometimes in debates that people who have spent ages researching a topic when they're in a debate with someone who's just uh, a denier or something to the public, it seems like they are on a level footing and that's partly because they're not confident enough. So I think being confident and being quite strident in the power of science and, and that is, is important. So I would say my take is you should, you shouldn't be afraid to call out BS basically. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to read a question that is addressed to Martin. Um, by building dams, the forest could be saved, but it is well known the strong impact of dams on water life. How can we deal with it? I wouldn't know, actually. To be fair, the kennel wasn't there before. Has been newly introduced, so I don't dare to say how much new water life has been introduced there as well. But yeah, some things will always be lost, changing the environment. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer to that. Okay. So maybe to make it a bit more generic, I think there are also plans to make. Um, to save Jakarta from thinking into the sea. 
basically you build a huge, enormous dam in front of the city. That would also kill a lot of wildlife and would uh, prevent access to the sea by all the fishermen living there. Um, which is maybe also an interesting conundrum to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. I see it. Oh, yeah. This question is related to energy generation. I, think, I see this as generation and other way energy generation has a huge impact. I mean, it might have a huge impact or not in society or environment. But I see like energy generation a huge trade off. Or you generate a huge amount of energy and produce tons of CO2 or whatever, but you can control it better. And or you build a huge dam, flood a, a huge area, but afterwards you do not generate. So in the end, you have to take what you want, like less CO2 generation and, le and, and less consistency, or you know, so. Uh, it's I think it's tricky and in this transition that we are facing uh, like we just can't I see the necessity of change quickly but uh, no we can just leave the fossil fuel so quick like that because we can rely too much on on the renewables so I see this question like that and it's well, as you said it's tricky but many people sometimes don't see that as, as a trade-off yeah. Yeah, maybe focus on your another poll. Yeah, definitely we go there. Um this one. Do you think that for combating the climate crisis, it matters whether you use Python, R, or Julia? Mm. I think that's the central question of the discussion for, isn't it? Maybe I can answer that. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I think there are many ways with this answer. Uh, no, I I don't think it matters. I'm reminded of a book by Boris Okoro. That's titled Information Doesn't Want to Be Free. It's about what we do with it. And instead of doing the hackathon tonight, I could write a, a Bitcoin miner in Julia and uh, we'll probably offset some of the carbon we saved by doing some other computations. Um, so no, I don't think the, the choice of language matters. Of course, you have to choose the language based on what it's good at. Choice you too. Yeah, make a good choice. Yeah, but Martin also can do the hackathon and save some life in Switzerland. Yeah, I think it's the tick, that, the tick like, hackathon is actually a good thing. Yeah, yeah, and the the people probably have the the, the knowledge to to save other people and yeah. And it, it might want to do. yeah, and then it doesn't matter which language you use. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Maybe I will say something from the back. Here. That's the best, uh, the best thing you can do is fight. By my previous, I don't, I don't agree with more fight. I don't agree with uh, war fighting, but this is something important. The, the best what you can do, in fact, is to stop confusion. Stop confusion. Because earth science generates probably the most comprehensive data sets all over the world. We need to store the data. We need to <clears throat> provide the data all the time, right? We need to compute the data. We need to train models in very big data sets. And how many energy it consumes? Does anybody ask about it? Ask itself how many energy it consumes? How many computational uh, resources we take? I mean, geoscience. Geoscience and observation, the most sensitive and so on and so on, all, 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 the, all the time. Probably we take the biggest part of the computational energy consumption. Maybe not, maybe the second. So who? What? Oh, Bitcoin. Yeah. So maybe, maybe 
So this is this is this is the this is the question about the net okay. electric technology. Uh, I don't think that uh, we can save energy by optimization of, of, of the computation, but I, I think that this is what I think. Robin? All right, so yeah, just one follow up. I'm I'm pretty sure videos of cats come close to this. Like if you think about how much uh, how many people are using are watching videos of cats compared with how many people are doing um, processing of large data sets? I suspect it's negligible. And the one thing that I want to say, one area where we can definitely do better as a community is international travel. That's about 3% of CO2 emissions, but maybe more like 5% if you take into a, a account the um, amplifier effect of emission, emitting at high altitude. And I'm just really glad to see loads of people have traveled here by train. And I think that's something that we can do better as a community. So um, yeah, I'm sure there's things that we can target, but I suspect that compute isn't the number one, but I haven't got any evidence. Maybe someone else does. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't agree, unfortunately, with Eric that we should like stop doing science. I mean, just... It's completely, not, not completely. This is not but, a statement. But, this is not a factual question. So that's okay, right. but completely to stop. I mean, we lose opportunity to find solutions. You know, so. Uh, but for example, yes, we can do more efficient computing, and we could, um, you know, generate uh, electricity from alternative sources of energy, solar panels, whatever. Uh, and also just like I look at the many big data problems, you know, um, if you just compress the data in a better way, if you just compress it, and if you just do, if you just educate people to do proper data engineering, so don't start computing something before you really know exactly what you're doing. Because computing also comes at cost, you know. At OpenGeo, how we're very careful, we have a limited uh, budget and, you know, every computing we do, we do data engineering. So we don't just compute. Uh, experiment with our, whatever, but just remember this: just proper data compression, a proper way you organize the data can save you probably two, three times of uh, bandwidth passing the data, computing the data. Thank you, Tom. And definitely on that same note, I would like to ask the audience uh, about it. So some research showed that computing AI uses a lot of electricity and still has a high footprint. How can we reduce the footprint of computing? Mm. Please let us know ideas here. Julia. <laughs> <laughs> no computing. <laughs> Teaching. Don't Indian. duplicate data. Superconductor. It's not exist. Seems like everyone has different what? ideas. There's not a no winner yet. <laughs> Wait for a quantum computer. Nuclear fu fusion. Nuclear <laughs> fusion. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Definitely. Interesting. I see also the hackathon here. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Okay. No computing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving Julia forward. Wins. I think I comment on this. And, Please. And, and not on the Julia part. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's about compression, and I will answer previous you said about some time doing computation on lower resolutions because it's effective enough, especially we as the open source community. I think, well, basically controlling many of our tools are in a fantastic position to basically say the default resolution is now low, right? Or in GDO, compression is by default on, and it's like, 
a nice level as well. And then you change it for, well, I, I wanted to say millions of users, but do we have so many users? Well, hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, that can definitely make an impact. Well, we basically control the defaults. I may add that just being conscious about the emissions that you actually are generating with your work is already a very big step. Like if you are thinking of, oh, I just want to try this cool deep learning neural network thing. And just for that, you need a GPU with this and that and all this data and everything just for a test and maybe it's something that you want to think once or twice before actually starting. Like, can I really know that my code will be efficient? Will I spend hours running and getting a model that is completely useless? Things like these are already uh, going to make a little bit of a difference, I hope. Thank you, Lorena. Faye? Oh, um, yeah, just I did getting the words. The individual responsibility to talk a little bit mm -hmm. and like the biggest emitters are still not individuals and when we think about uh, computing or ai technology that is using a lot of energy well yes we as a community use a lot of energy but the biggest like computing energy right now is bitcoin chat gpt also increases energy use a lot and um yeah i think uh, yeah as as a as a as, as a geo computing and i'm getting a bit off track of the question we we should focus a bit more on um who we support with our computation like do we support the uh carbon stocks which like who will use it probably companies that um have data and plant trees to offset their carbons? Or do we uh, support people that are actually, um, I don't know, defending forests? Like there is this project called Forest Forces. They 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 do that. There's um, some people I know that use drones to make maps of threatened forests so that they know how to defend them. Like, I think we can choose better who to target with the knowledge we have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now go back to the Q&A to see which questions okay. we have there. Uh, we'll go now on this topic that I also believe it's fascinating is like publishing. So the first question I see here is, what do you think is the solution or the alternative for the current system we have for publishing, Elsevier, et cetera? Who would like to maybe comment on that? Well, for me, it's pretty simple. Diamond open access. So also not based on publishing companies, but based on open institutions, whether it's universities or other sort of research, really open research institute that can do the hosting. Uh, we can have open reviews and uh, yeah, just everybody benefits. This is already what happens with uh, the Journal of Open Source Software. Um, there are several other um, initiatives popping up all the time, maybe for earth sciences, not as many as for physics or any others, but let's hope there are more and more coming out there. But uh, yeah, and the most important thing is for me that senior scientists also have to support these initiatives because otherwise <laughs> as early researchers, early career researchers, um, are trying to support that, but then this doesn't have the reputation that we would need um, to actually make this impact with our work or actually have our PhD thesis approved because our supervisor think that doesn't have enough of an impact factor. Um, if our supervisors would also support this and they would also publish there, then probably that could really be a way to go forward. Completely agreed. And also hiring committees have to update their standards and realize that 
it's not just this handful of journals that charge five thousand dollars per publication to make it open access are worthwhile but that there are other metrics which matter or should matter much much more so yeah senior scientists have to walk away from these journals like is happening in a lot of domains right now just give it up being an editor working for free it's like why why are people even doing it <laughs> stop it well it's vanity yeah so <laughs> it's it's funny but i completely second second you in that uh, in that opinion that the main sort of the main blocking factor is the senior sort of the, the people in power positions like me um and um of course as a as a junior you you can you know influence the choice you make and 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 consider this this aspect in in the choices that you can make but there are, you have much more constraints and uh, giving up sort of editorial positions and, and sort of ignoring publishers you know completely uh, is is something that that only seniors can do and uh, but the other thing they have to do is work on alternative infrastructure mm -hmm. right you can actually set up your own journal for with very little effort and your university library will be more than happy to support you technically with an OJS instance and things uh, so so there are no technical uh, problems there is just the activity of doing it right and uh, and then spending time on on proper editing right mm -hmm. on, and doing that and that is this thing that uh, so it's uh, it's a matter of of shifting your your attention from uh what what people are doing now to to helping actually going back to actually the manual work of, of editing a journal it's a lot of work mm -hmm. it's, that is the case so it's so it's hard so it's not it, i don't see it happening uh, fast enough, just incre incredibly slow, and it probably needs a generation uh, change, I'm afraid. Thank you, Ed, sir. Anyone else wants to elaborate on this? Okay. It, towards the time of yes. So, uh, I will move forward to uh, another question, which I find very interesting, and it's is the way out of uh, the climate crisis more of a political than a technological problem, perhaps? What do you think? Yes, it's more political, but yes. there is also technological challenges. We can have a solution, you know, now. We have some ideas. You know, but we, we don't have something, it's like a uh, slam dunk that we know how we're going to solve it. Technological means that we have tools to change, but certain means we need to change the kids. So, but for example, industrial carbon sequestration is not worked out, and it's not the experiment. Also, the reforestation projects are experimenting. We, we don't know exactly what's the best way to do it. Um, so, so definitely, we need to do. We still need to do research, but but politics is bigger. Politics is a bigger problem. Yeah, uh, this is the answer. I think uh, I'm from Brazil. So I came here in Austria and I saw that's a completely different reality. And when I say Brazil, you can take into consideration the whole Latin America that um, like, it's incredible how people care so much about recycling and how it's on daily lives of people. So this is just an example. Uh, I mean, and like how perfectly works the transportation system that you don't need a ticket or whatever, just go inside. And if somebody arrives, you show a QR code or whatever. So like this shows different uh, societies that we have in our world than here. Like uh, when we say it's political, it's social and things like that, because here people are aware because they somehow have their, uh, pyramid of i don't know the name but the comfortable let's call it uh it's a hundred percent not a hundred percent but it's very guaranteed 
So you can start thinking of other things. You can see that how it reflects also in the EU uh, politics, like you're discussing AI uh, uh, laws, which is, I think it's more than necessary. But if you go to Latin America, people will still be discussing uh, how how can we make kids go to school more often or um, and and uh, hunger, so people are still starving. So like, it's societal is like obviously technology can come to improve it, but I think in the end is like the. Okay, it, it I might get too tricky to, to say this, but it involves the economical system, the way people behave, how the politicians make the laws, like who wants to real change for the better or not, or just ruling for their own interest. So uh, the more we talk about it, that's the deeper we go, but like having this opportunity to live here and see how different it is, for me, I'm already a pessimistic person regarding climate change, but like this makes me feel like mm, I think we, like we, there might be a techno a technology, and I really hope so, but right now I don't think we can solve it, and it's definitely political, society, technological, whatever. So that's tricky. Thank you. I think that that's something we have to the solution. Uh, as it has been kind of watered down in the, in the objectives by the Parliament, the European Parliament. So the even if you have, so basically what happened is that uh, the natural social law would um, allow the um, uh, protection of wetlands, for example. Uh, among other habitats. And the uh, wetlands, of course, are huge um, uh, emitting a lot of carbons, like a huge emission of carbon. And uh, basically, even if there was a technology to demonstrate a technology to do like a restoration of wetland, it would be against interest of other, um, let's say, a sector such as agriculture. So even if you have a technology that could solve the problem with restoration, prefer restoration of wetlands, mm -hmm. degraded wetlands, you still need to face a problem with another interest of another kind of party. And so it's political, mm -hmm. totally. Thank you so much. Uh, now we are heading towards the end of this session, so I will continue and I will uh, yeah, appreciate if you make your contributions and try to be, make it a bit uh, or brief, even though I know and we know this uh, topic is very uh, important and it, yeah, it, it requires a lot of debate. Um, I will go again to the poll part. So what efforts could be made to educate programming communities about the importance of climate actions? Remember, you have three words maximum here to comment on. So I'll start reading them. Maybe one of our uh, panelists can elaborate on what they think, what we see here. Self-example. Citizen science. Well, we were joking before about the best heads going to the places where they are paid best, right? So maybe we have to push a bit more towards educating people in a way that maybe they think twice whether they should start to fund another fintech startup that is just about pulling people's money out of their pockets. Um, at least they should feel bad about it, I guess um so that would be one idea yeah participants believe citizen science is key here yeah definitely conference political awareness and much more okay i will move to the next question to try to 
cover as much as possible. So the next poll is, and the next question is, can collaborative and open software FOSS help combat the climate crisis? Most people believe yes. Some are hesitant, apparently. There's a big maybe there. This uh, is competition. That's why we have this uh, discussion for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> At least no one says no. <laughs> <laughs> That's something. That's giving up, right? <laughs> Next one. Okay. Let's go. So how do we organize hackathons and datathons that have concrete goals of combating some climate crisis source? For example, car CO2 emission reduction. What do you think, Liz? Interesting. Brainstorming. <laughs> Bikes. Maybe we should combine it with blocking a highway. We, we sit down on a highway for the hackathon. No, but we do <laughs> Sit in. <laughs> yes. Okay, very interesting yeah. answers here. Let's meet. Right, that, that's an interesting point. I think our hotel, uh, I didn't see that often, but they have vegan milk in our hotel. It's one of the things I didn't expect. There's more awareness about this. No. Julia. Definitely, yes. Stop with Julia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use Python for the months. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe we could uh, follow Anita in some project who tries to connect all European railways on a nice timetable so we can actually travel further and more easily or something. That, that could have an impact. But we still need to policy somewhere in the policy matrix. Okay, yes. Yeah, just make one comment uh, regarding this, for example, uh, selection of uh, uh, transportation that we are using. So I would say it uh, really differs among the countries who have a good transportation network, for example, train network, and the one who don't. So in the one who don't have it, uh, the politician would promote this like a personal decision, use uh, train, use bikes, but if the infrastructure is not there, then it really depends on the political decisions. If we are going to invest in the transportation network that, that can really be alternative to the personal cars. So in some countries, it is more personal decisions, but in others, it's really the political question. Sometimes you have the privilege of a choice, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think this was our last uh, poll and also question of the day. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, but we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much to the panelists that are with us today. And definitely you will know about the uh, upcoming blog post on this. So thank you for joining us today.